So we can start one minute before time schedule. That's great. Uh, welcome to the last session of the festival. This session is about the future of antitrust in America and in Europe. And when you are looking for somebody that is willing to make predictions about the future, either you turn to astrologists or you go for economists. And we decided that you know, the second option would be more in line with the content of the festival. And I'm very pleased to have uh, four distinguished economists uh, for this uh, last session and to ask them questions about the future of, of antitrust. So on my left, uh, there is uh, Jan uh, Eckhout. He's a uh, research professor at the uh, University Pompeo Fabra and Barcelona School of Economics, and professor of economics at the University College of London. Uh, although his main research interests are macroeconomics and labor economics, recently he uh, has worked a lot on market power, which is, uh, as you know, a key uh, concept in uh, competition policy. And he published, uh, wrote a very uh, influential book, uh, The Profit Paradox. Okay, you can see it, which is very interesting, and I recommend everybody reading it. It matches it. <laughs> Almost. Uh, the second speaker who is connected online is Thomas Philippon. Thomas is a professor of finance at New York University, Stern School of Business. He has also studied various topics in macroeconomics and finance, systemic risk, financial crisis, and so on. And he also recently turned his attention to competition, and he also has a book on this, which is this one, The Great Reversal. And um, I also recommend reading this book. So it seems that macroeconomists are very much interested in, uh, um, well, we might call I.O., industrial organization, market power, uh, and competition. Then we have Nancy Rose. She's a professor of applied economics at the MIT uh, Department of Economics. Her research and teaching focus on industrial organization, competition policy, and economics of regulation. And Rose has also uh, an experience as a regulator, we would say, as she served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Economic Analysis in the Antitrust Division of the U.S. Department of Justice from uh, 2014 to 2016. And finally, on my right, there is Tommaso Valletti. Uh, Tommaso is a professor of economics at Imperial College Business of School and also the University of Rome, uh, Tor Vergata. Tommaso's main uh, research interests are in industrial economics, regulation, and competition economics. And he also has been involved in competition law enforcement in uh, various roles. He has been chief competition economist at DigiComp, a member of uh, the panel of academic advisors of the UK Competition Commission, and currently is a member of the panel of academic ad advisor of Ofcom. So thank you to all of you for joining this panel. Um, I have prepared a set of questions, uh, but uh, uh, maybe too many questions. I would like to leave some time for questions from the floor, so I will refrain from probably asking all the questions. And the questions generally will be about what we should do, what we can do, and what is likely to happen, what will happen in antitrust uh, enforcement. But before going to the future, I think we might start with some reflections on the past, because you know, to understand what we have to do, uh, we want to first uh, know whether there are lessons that we can learn from what we did in the past. So, according to many people, I have to say, uh, uh, competition law enforcement in the last decades 
has not delivered completely what it was supposed to deliver, um, leading to market power in many industries, and, uh, and, and, and particularly in, in tech markets. So many are complaining about the under enforcement of competition rules. And so my question to Jan and to Ma is uh, whether they agree with this assessment and whether they think that this assessment applies equally to Europe and to the United States. Uh, th thank you, Paolo. Thank you for uh, setting up this, this session and the, the great conference. Um, first of all, I should, should say that, you know, there's a language of economists, there's a language of lawyers, but I think there's also a different language of some economists who are macroeconomists who I would say probably if Tomai and I are more uh, inclined to in the language of the uh, IO economists. So, so maybe the language may be a channel for uh, a challenge for some of you, so, so bear me, be, with me if it, it is. Um, so what I think Tomai and I look at is more a macro perspective and it's a slightly different perspective from what you know, most people in this room uh, look at, which is more of a micro perspective. And does it make a big difference? Yes and no, because we look at the same things. The only thing is that what we have looked at is, you know, going back to what the evidence from the past is, is really a across the entire economy, rather than focus on one firm on one market, we really look at the entire economy as, as large a set of firms as we can get our uh, hands uh, data on. Uh, uh, and, and so one of the things that we see is that markets are rising. They've been rising in the 1980s from around 1.2 to 1.6, so that's a, a substantial rise. You might say no concern necessarily because we also see that, you know, fixed costs, whatever that means, um, have been rising. So that might just be markets rise because we have a different technology. You know, we need more investment, maybe lower marginal costs, and that's the reason why we have seen rising markets. The thing is we also see profitability in all kinds of measures uh, that we use for that rising. So it's not just that the markets go up, profitability goes up, and that seems to suggest that there's something more than just margins going up, there's, there's, there's something uh, else. Also, if you look at market valuations, that is publicly traded firms, we see that that ratio, for example, market valuation to sales has uh, 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 gone up by a factor of three. It was 0 0.5 in 19. Uh, 80, it's 1.5 now. Now, first of all, it, this is not for all firms. This is for a very select number of firms. In fact, if you look at the median firm in the distribution of markups or of profit rates, the median firm's markup hasn't moved. It's about the same. That means that at, at least half of the firms haven't seen much of a change. Half of the firms have seen a decline in profitability. What we do see is that in the top 90th percentile, for example, we see an enormous rise. Okay, and that's really accounting for when I quoted the headline number, that was the number for the average in the economy. So this is all majoritarily driven by this 90th percentile. So there's a small number of very dominant firms in the cross-section, if you want, of uh, uh, the macroeconomy that we see uh, 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 rising profitability, uh, rising, rising markups. So it's true that it's in that technology has something to do with it, but we see it in all sectors. I always say it's from tech to textiles, but the firms in textile, and one example is Inditex, for example, a European company, is using technology very heavily. I mean, after all, Amazon is also not a tech company when you look at it, how we classify companies, because it's retail. And so as a retail, Amazon is clearly a tech company, but in the retail sector. And so Inditex is a kind of a textiles company, but in, 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 a, in a sector which is a traditional sector, textiles. And so the important thing is that it's economy-wide, but technology plays a, 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 an important role. And, and to that extent, one of the things that we see is that technology is responsible for what we see because we see this fixed cost investments, uh, uh, innovation going up. And that's related to the firms that have the highest markets, the highest profit rates. So firms seems to invest to become more profitable. And it's, in fact, the fixed cost that's going up nearly exclusively as a share of their sales of these, these dominant firms. So they use this, this is an old argument by Sutton in his two books that he's put forward that, that firms invest to become more productive. And so the first thing to notice is that 
there's something very good about this rising profitability and markups of these firms becoming more efficient. There's a large increase in the efficiency and what we do as macroeconomists, and maybe here I kind of might lose you on, on, on the language, we try and you know, build models and estimate these models and what we see is that there's enormous efficiency gains. Marginal costs are dropping of these firms, but at the same time, because the extent to which there is competition declines, these firms can also basically at the same time lower prices and increase markups. So think of it as follows, you increase the efficiency because your costs are going down. At the same time, you become more competitive, so relative to your competitors, you lower prices. But of course, the decline in prices that we see is much less than the decline in cost, and that's giving us basically the rise in margins that I, I spoke about earlier for these dominant firms. And then we do welfare analysis. There was in the session just before on, on monopsony here, a discussion about you know, how to measure welfare. We do welfare in the kind of the macro sense. We can discuss about that uh, later if, if you want. We see that there's a positive welfare effect from this efficiency, large, to the order of 12% of GDP comparing 1980 to the last few years. So that's enormous. But at the same time, we see a welfare loss of 20% that's due to basically the ability of firms that face less competition to extract rents. Okay, and so there's this kind of fight, this horse race between the positive effect of higher efficiency and uh, basically the, the higher ability to extract rents due to the fact that there's less, less competition. And so I think that's to kind of from, from this macro side to us the, 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 the most uh, striking uh, uh, headline fact, I think, which is that there's on net an 8% loss in welfare, okay, comparing 1980 to the, uh, to the last years. And the question is, of course, you know, why is there no more entry? Because if a firm like Amazon can do it, if, if Meta can do it, if Google can do it, if Inditex can do it, why can't competitors do it? And the other thing that we do in this process is we estimate production functions, which is part of the process of getting these uh, markups, because we need to estimate production functions to get at the elasticity, uh, 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 the demand elasticity for these goods. What we see is that given this, um, um, this technology, that there's a lot more presence of scale economies for many of these, these firms. And this can come from the new technologies. It come, comes from the fact that they use data, that they have network effects in social networks, but more generally the way they sell their goods, that there's platforms. Platforms typically have enormous network effects, and network effects basically are increasing returns to scale. And given this increasing returns to scale, this scale economy is now at a global level because, you know, what an Uber or a Google or one of these companies does now has you know, implications for a world market. And this is exactly what we see. These dominant firms really have um, a, a, a world mar market. Now, it's because of this increasing returns to scale that we get these lack of entry of competitors because precisely you, as a firm who has these returns to scale, can make your production as efficient as no one else can because there's no point in having two competing platforms. Okay? And I think this is already kind of hinting at what the type of solutions that we will be talking about later uh, uh, as, because in a sense it's very old school monopoly, natural monopoly, right? We had that at the turn of the last century in 1900 when, well, the monopolies were really very technological, very much physical capital, railways, electricity, and things like that. And today they're of a different nature, more virtual, but they also still have a very strong monopoly uh, uh, component, natural monopoly uh, component. At least that's what we see when we estimate these production functions that these firms en employ. And now, you know, is it different from what it was, let's say, 120 years ago to today? Well, of course, the technologies are different. The marginal cost is virtually zero for many of these products. The fixed costs are equally high. But I think the mechanism is very similar. You know, when J.P. Morgan had the, I think it was the Northern Railway Company. He basically, you know, it was clearly much more efficient than crossing the United States with a horse-drawn carriage. 
there was enormous efficiency gains, much lower cost, but he wasn't passing these costs on to the customers. Okay, and I think we see very similar things in many of these uh, uh, digital technologies. So I'm gonna leave it here. We'll come back to some of the uh, solutions, uh, uh, but that's just a summary of, of what I want to say. Thank you very much, <coughs> Jan. Thomas, can you tell us your view on this and whether you know, Europe and the US are different in this respect, your opinion? Well, yes, so thank you uh, for the invitation. I'm sorry I cannot be here um, with you. Um, so, I, so I don't want to repeat what, what, what Jan just said, so let me just uh, you know, follow up. Um, so I think one way to think about it <clears throat> is uh, you make a two by two table. There is US, Europe and tech, non-tech. So, you know, you can think about how did things evolve in the non-tech sector in Europe, in the US, and the tech sector in each, okay? So, let's start with the non-tech. So, that, by that, I mean, essentially, the non-internet platforms, Amazon, Google style. And there, I think that uh, the, the, the evolution in uh, Europe and the US are really quite different. So, first of all, the profit rates. So, the excess profit margins, it's only a US phenomenon, okay? Profit rate in Europe are flat. Labor share is flat. There is no sense in which uh, in the non-tech sector firms in Europe are making excess profit. There are many sectors where profit rates have come down, like the telecom industry or the airlines. And the reason is that there's been a massive improvement in competition policy at the EU level over the past 20 years. So we have many markets in Europe that used to be much less competitive than their equivalent markets in, in the US. So again, prime example, take uh, access to internet at home used to be twice more expensive uh, in Paris or, or, or London to get access to internet uh, from your home 20 years ago. And now it's twice more expensive in the US. In fact, the last data I saw is more like three times. Okay, So if you live in, in a middle-sized town in France, you're going to pay less than half of what somebody would pay in the US for the same exact speed uh, for your internet at home. Okay, And that's purely because of competition. Um, so uh, in Europe, there's been a massive improvement in that dimension. You can also see it in transport. You can see it in many other industries. Not all of them, but many of them. Uh, in the US, in the non-tech sector, in particular the non-tech, non-tradable sector, you see rising prices and rising margins. And it's, it's pretty much only a market power story. Uh, it's not technology. The technology is the same. The reason uh, Comcast charges twice as much as the internet provider in France is because they are a monopoly in many regions, and and their technology is exactly the same as in Europe. So I think there there is a failure of um, competition policy. Now I'm not saying it's antitrust enforcement because if you actually look at the way it was done in Europe, in some market it did take the form of uh, say merger control, for instance. The, the last prime example was the merger of Siemens and Alstom that was blocked by the commission. So that's clearly a merger control. But in many other industries, it was more like a buyer to entry uh, licensing story, which got better in Europe. So I'm not saying it's only a merger control antitrust story. It is broadly a competition policy. But there, I think there is a, a major improvement in Europe. And if you look at today, for instance, like, uh, you know, Essentially, prices. If you look at if you look at prices in Europe and and, and the U.S. for the non-tech sector, um, the entire drop, uh, relative drop in the labor share in the U.S. is due to non-tradable uh, producers in the U.S. That's the place where you can exert a market power, and that's where you see prices being rising faster than in Europe over the past uh, 20 years. Um, so, in that sense, I think there is a lesson, which is Europe should continue whatever it is doing and the U.S. should go back to being more aggressive in, in many of these markets. Um, second, in the tech sector, so that, of course, is different. So there, I think it's fair to say that nobody has found um, a satisfactory solution, and I don't think, um, I don't think the outcomes, the, 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 maybe the uh, attention, the, the, the desire to do something was different in Europe and the U.S., but the outcomes are not that different. So... The Europeans tried to do uh, something earlier than the Americans uh, regarding the tech sector, but I don't think they were very successful. To, at the end of the day, the outcomes are not that different. Um, and as Jan said, that sector is uh, also interesting because the tension between technological advance and market power is, which is true in every sector, by the way, okay? But it is, it is like stronger in the tech sector. Um, so, uh, so there it's also um, the place where it is more difficult to find the right balance. So that's why I think to some extent it's harder for the regulators. Now, 
the one thing that I would be, uh, I would, so I agree with what uh, Jan was saying, but I think, I, I think there's a really big danger of thinking, you know, this time is different. Like, okay, so scale economies, you know, yes, maybe a little bit more in the tech, but I mean, damn, like if you look at the industries of the past, look at the telecom industry in the past, look at the pharmaceutical chemis, chemical industry in the past, they had huge return to scale. And we still manage to keep two or three or four competitors and to have a pretty healthy competitive system. So I think the idea that the return to scale or the, the, the you know the fixed cost ratio is much, much higher in tech, I don't even think it's true in the data. I think that what might be true is that in the old days, it would take a bit like the speed at which you can achieve dominance is much faster today than it, than it used to be. So in the old days, if taking the chemical sector in Europe and some firms started to dominate, it would take 10 or 15 years to get to really market dominance for the entire market. In the social uh, network, it would take six months. So there's a sense in which the regulators have much less time to react. But I think that might be the true issue rather than fundamentally, the, the literally like the inclusion return to scale being higher in this. Because I think in the past, we had a lot of industries. With, we had network industries in the past as well. So, um, so that's the first thing. The second thing in the tech sector is, um, although I agree again that there, there is the technological part is key. If you look at the outcome in terms of productivity growth, it's not that impressive. So if you look at the, the, the productivity growth by the leading companies in the US in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, their productivity growth was just as impressive as the productivity growth achieved by Amazon and, and, and Google today. So yes, the tech sector is the, one of the leading engines for growth, but they are not amazing by historical standards. So I don't think we should treat them uh, in any different way than we did uh, in the past. Um, so that's, that's my question. I don't think it's that different from what we saw in the past. And I think we should approach it in the same way. To me, the challenge is that um, these markets move faster than the equivalent markets of the past. And therefore, it, there is more of a challenge for the regulator to intervene uh, in time. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, uh, Tommaso, Nancy, do you want briefly comment? Maybe a quick reaction to what Jan said. Sometime, somehow he, he said that concentrated markets that we observe are exposed evidence of, um, you know, that big firms are more, are more efficient, which is a narrative I have some problems with. But if I want to bring this result to the context of this conference, which is an audience of competition policy, that's not the question we typically deal with. The question is, should those firms be allowed to merge with other firms? Should they be allowed to do certain behaviors? And what's interesting, again, if you, is that there is no evidence whatsoever that those mergers brought efficiencies. So this narrative around efficiency uh, coming from mergers simply does not exist in the data. Studies are limited. There is, instead, there is imperfect evidence, but the evidence that we have that most of the mergers that we have approved actually increase prices. So the context we are discussing here is slightly different. It's not whether, okay, this is the natural outcome of some organic growth which has led to, uh, no. The question we have you know, in front of us is, uh, is there any potential efficiency gains coming from Google buying yet another firm when these guys have some incredible resources and they should you know, make rather than buy? And this is the more focused question that sometimes we have to, 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 to answer in, in, in the actual cases. And the second reflection I have, and again, we may discuss this during the, the, um, the panel, if indeed, as Jan is saying, the cost structure is changing more and more upfront fixed costs and lower and lower marginal costs. I mean, as economists, we know the solution to that is uh, regulation, right? Because it's very inefficient to have more than one firm, which again would be a strange narrative there. And I agree with Thomas that I would want to have three, four firms in the market because ultimately uh, it seems to be viable. But, but is, isn't that then the natural outcome of this reasoning rather than asking to do some strange welfare tra 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 trade-offs? We do have an answer. So if the, the answer is that technology has changed. This is for a public utility type of regulation, isn't it? So if I could just jump in on that as somebody who spent um, <laughs> most of my uh, career until I went to the Department of Justice in 2014 um, studying economic regulation, I've got to say I've got a lot more um, uh, hesitancy than my fellow panelists seem to have about, well, if we've got industries with big fixed costs, let's just jump back into 
um, regulation. We know how to do that. We did public utility regulation from the, the early 1900s on. Um, and I would just caution that I think we have quite significant evidence um, that the economic regulation is often poorly suited to highly innovative or dynamic sectors. It tends to um, uh, throw a lot of salt into the gears and slow things down in ways that create um, potentially quite significant welfare losses. Um, I think one only needs to look at uh, uh, how long it took for the U.S. bubble telephony industry to get off the ground under SEC regulation um, as an example of that. Um, but I, And I think the other problem is that regulation has its costs as well. And so, I, you know, I, I think what's interesting is, well, in, a, in an idealized economic model, as Tommaso mentioned, we might think that if we've got a very high fixed cost industry, natural monopoly is the efficient um, uh, and inevitable perhaps outcome. And so we just need to embrace that natural monopoly and regulate it. In fact, there was work done during the regulated era that showed that if one accounts for imperfect regulation, which is you know, a, a very significant thing one must consider, not just imperfect competition in markets, that in some cases it's better to, to embrace um, you know, multi-firms with some cost inefficiencies, but to get that competitive um, dynamic going rather than to rely on a regulator. And the final thing I'll say about that is, um, just as there are differences in competition enforcement uh, across the Atlantic, um, there are regulatory differences. And I have to say, I, I think those are perhaps, um, with the exception of the abuse of dominance clause that the, that the European Commission has in its um, portfolio and its arsenal, I think the regulatory differences are quite substantial. And I just look at you know an industry like electric um, uh, electricity, electric markets, electric utilities, and the differences say between what the UK was able to accomplish in that space and what the US experience is to say, um, it, one would not want to embrace a one size fits all um, recommendation for regulation, particularly where um, political influences are very important and, and um, agency capture um, is, um, is a real threat to, to any positive outcome. Okay, thank you very much. I'm almost uh, uh, run out of time with uh, just one question, but you know. <laughs> um, okay, before we we move to uh, to regulation, let's go back to competition policy. And um, you know, we started this uh, this festival with a session on on the future for uh, the more economic approach in in competition law enforcement, uh, and. Some believe that uh, you know that the under enforcement might be due also to the use, the wrong use, or to use of economics in uh, uh, in competition law enforcement because too much weight has been given to efficiency with respect to other goals, uh, or. Um, or uh, because you know the economics was used to you know to, to provide leeway to anti-competitive behavior. So I was wondering whether you think the economic profession uh, you know bears some responsibility for these, and whether to expect in the future. Do you think that we go back to some more formalistic approach, or to the use of other? notions for antitrust enforcement, such as, uh, you know, the competitive process, uh, which I, you know, find hard to understand what it means. Tommaso, do you want to answer this? Sure. Part? So the um, short answer, uh, our economists to, um, to share, well, you start from, from, from one proposition, which is there has been some historical under enforcement, and I think that's true. So I forget about the big picture, narrow down to, again, the context of competition policy, numbers are what they are, we can interpret them in different ways, but The Economist was saying that, say, the Department of Justice in the early 2000s would bring about 180 merger cases a year, and then uh, 10 years later they went down to 70. So these are numbers. And just remember, these are the numbers of, of mergers which have been investigated. In the, in, in the U.S. economy, there are about, what, 15 to 20,000 mergers every year. So look at... Remember those numbers. In, in the European Union, um, roughly 
450, 400 mergers are notified to Digicomp every year. Of those, 95% go through this quick assessment with no economics. They just go through. It's a tick the box kind of exercise. The remaining, there is either you know, a phase two or some remedies. Prohibitions are unheard of. So on average, in the past 30 something years, Digicomp has blocked one merger per year, one. Of course, there's also the national authorities, there's more to that. But if you look at the, these are the numbers. And again, people like to interpret numbers in different ways, but these are the levels of where we are in a context, again, Europe, which has about 15,000 mergers per year, okay? And then one is blocked every year. So there has been, and this is has coincided in these past 30 years with greater you know, economic use, economic approach to antitrust. So at least there is a very strong correlation between the use of economics and certain outcomes we had in, in uh, cases. Um, my view is that economics is partly to blame for this result. Let me elaborate rather than the journalistic headline. <laughs> Economists are, are to blame. So basically, let's start a little bit, I'm an academic, but in the 80s, it was the, the, the golden days of uh, game theory applied to industrial organization, the book of Tyrol, et cetera, and we produced so many results which was even embarrassing how many results we could have. Any, any good economist, in theory, could produce an interesting model that would be published that would, would tell you anything goes, okay? And these were, this is where we, we were in the 80s. And then that triggered a reaction in academia. We said, let's stop doing that because that's not very interesting. Uh, let's try to move towards some empirical approaches. And we followed a particular path in empirical IO of doing very rigorous analysis in very specific market setting. Forget about cross-industry studies. It has to be a narrow industry where we have a well-defined. So as a kind of semi-joke, and Nancy will disagree with me, but I say, so typically we have studied cement, uh, yogurt, and cereals, okay? Because because these are data sets that we command uh, and we understood quite a bit and we did, uh, of course, we established important methods that in principle could be applied to other industries, but these are methods where, you know, this is where academia departed from policy somehow because they're not actionable for cases, because it takes literally five to six years to write a paper in industrial organization in, with uh, st uh, structural methods. In principle, yes, you could apply it in a case. In practice, you have two months and you, you cannot do it. So, so most of the uh, academic research, which is super interesting and it has delivered also interesting insights into industries but is somewhere else okay these guys uh, do not have methods which are uh, actionable for for competition policy instead on the consulting side something happened again the initial motivations were good using a more rigorous economic approach to antitrust meant to be you know systematic and logical about things etc but the problem is that then that process soon became hijacked by certain corporate interests and it's not surprising if you think of a political economy that's where the money is the money is with the large corporation it's not with the academics academics were doing something else and, and, and instead the consultants deliver what the clients wanted and so all this richness of results of off-the-shelf available results is exactly what uh, the, the, the consultant started to do, and we became merchant of doubt. So anything, there is something, but I can claim that this is even the most you know, egregious abuse of dominance. I can construct a case where, in principle, there is something nice, and then the burden of proof is on you, regulator, to tell me that. So this is where economics has gone in practice. So economic thinking, and again, the applied economic thinking, let me do this distinction between uh, theory and practice, the way it, it is being transposed to policy, it's really worse structure for conservative arguments to preserve the status quo. And this is what had to be, you know, inserted under the guise of sophisticated and complex, okay, this is what the law, so this, this, is, this has produced dissatisfaction, okay? Dissatisfaction, and I think it's, it's interesting, many people have lost confidence in what economics can deliver. Lawyers, there's many lawyers in the room sometimes are coming to me as an economist and say, look, uh, we don't understand what you guys are, are discussing about. You, you, you cannot ever um, make your mind on anything, right? Is it you know, the digital platform? Is it in, in, innovation? Where do you stand? Where do you stand? So, so as, as, and, and, and the lawyers, therefore, are looking somewhere else if, as economists, we cannot come up with a way of being more, more helpful. There is also, I should say, and this is we're going to the next stage, what to do, a couple of things that we should try to 
you know, agree on. For instance, there is sometimes unrealistic expectation of what economics is about. Okay? So economics is not about a mathematical proof of something. Instead, sometimes the lawyers are telling us, give us a number, and this number, is that the number? You all agree with number? I mean, forget, if you think this is what economics is, is about, this is about policy making, making decisions under uncertainty. The, uh, the astrologists, maybe, yes, the astrologists can come up with a number, but we, we cannot. The only thing where perhaps we, are, as economists, we do, and the, again, there is a, a discrepancy between economics and lawyers sometimes, is that uh, for us economists, and there is a strong agreement that is that incentives matter, okay? Incenti economic incentive, and this is something we can help reason through, we can help model, we can, and th that's serious economics that we can follow, and, uh, and then we can disagree with the calibration, perhaps. But instead, for a lawyer, it's difficult to um, accept incentives as proof of something, okay? And this is a debate that if we can start having it, perhaps it's gonna be more conducive towards helpful you know, interaction between economics and law. But the lawyers don't like when we make arguments based on incentives. No, 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 we don't wanna hear that. We want to see a number. And then the discussion becomes a strange one. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tommaso. Now, you know, we know that you know, there is a subset of economists that should be blamed, the consultant. <laughs> Some consult. Okay, Nancy, yesterday we had a very lively uh, description of the situation in the U.S. from Bill uh, Kovacic. Uh, he's very uh, concerned about, you know, the path that uh, the U.S. agencies are taking. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> That's a pretty, pretty broad and open-ended question, particularly since I wasn't able... Um, with regrets to not being there now, but all, but also not uh, being able to listen to what um, Bill had to say. Bill is always um, lively and and um, provocative, I would say, and entertaining. So, <clears throat> without knowing exactly what he said, I'll give you I'll give you my views on on that question, and maybe um, you know maybe pick up on some of the themes that that Tommaso mentioned. So the first thing I would say is that um, I think there's a very important interaction between. Um, we could call it increased economics. I'll call it increased quantification, which I think Tommaso was already sort of picking up on that theme, and agency budgets. And if I look at the decrease in the number of actions that are brought by US agencies over time, I have to believe that a lot of that is due to the fact that our Congress chose to keep the enforcement agency budgets roughly flat pretty much in nominal terms, even declining in, in real terms during um, much of the last 20 or 30 years, um, at a time when the investigations and the litigation costs were increasing dramatically. You know, part of that is because the, the expectations, as Tommaso mentioned, have, have increased. And so, um, you know, my colleague Dave Gelfand at the DOJ called it the CSI effect that, you know, once you've seen crime shows that show you um, uh, criminals being put behind bars when DNA evidence is presented in court, then courts all think, well, if you can't show me DNA evidence to, to identify this person as the criminal, then, you know, maybe that's not the criminal and I have to let them go. I think in antitrust, that takes the form of if I can't quantify something with a regression um, or merger sim to the fourth decimal place. Um, then you know maybe the effect isn't real or doesn't matter, and I should let the the merger go through or the conduct prevail. Um, and there's nothing in economics that that inherently says that, but I do think there's some has been some economics hubris um, that has perhaps contributed to it. I think the overwhelming, um, probably the overwhelming contributor is really that there's money to be made by convincing courts of that standard because it makes it more difficult for plaintiffs, and so. Uh, the defense bar and, and defendants and big corporations all have an interest in, in advancing that kind of thinking. Um, but but I, I think economists perhaps until more recently have not done as much as they could to say, you know, this isn't really what the standard should be. It's not, it's, you know, there are no innovation harms um, if, if the plaintiff can't, if the government can't show with a regression analysis that this merger is gonna reduce innovation, for example. And I think if we look to places where the US enforcers and the EU have maybe varied a bit, again, I, I think they're, they're pretty consistent across the board. So I think any differences between the two have less to do with the competition enforcers and perhaps more to do with regulation and other, and other conditions. 
Um, but if I look to something like Dow DuPont, where I think the US, the DOJ had a harder time grappling with and coming up with a solution to potential innovation harms and the, the um, European Commission, you know, recognized, identified and, and acted on that. So I, I think this quantification is a problem. So, you know, where is the US likely to head? So as you pointed out, and I'm sure Bill has pointed out, um, there is a lot of frustration around this perceived under enforcement. Um, I don't think um, the leaders in either agency um, identified um, enforcement resources as being a major contributor to that problem. I think they're a little more aware of the impact of agency resource limitations now that they're having to make tough decisions and figure out how to how to stretch um, very thin um, uh, resources in terms of both people and money um, across a broader set of, of um, cases that they want to investigate and bring. Um, but I, I think they they feel economics has, has been to blame. And, you know, I would say the misuse of economics, I think, has is partially to blame. If we think about the Chicago school, um, you know, what and go back to Robert Bork, you know, the Bork book is full of assertions of theory as fact without any empirical um, evidence um, uh, to support that and no interest in empirical evidence to support that. And, and then I think what happened is that, you know, pro-business, pro-corporate, I would say, um, interest because I, you know, small, small business may be, you know, as much protected by, by um, rigorous antitrust enforcement as, as not. Um, but I think these pro-corporate interests identified this as a way to move the agencies and the judiciary, and they've invested a lot to move both of those. So the question is, can the agencies now decide, well, since we don't like the outcomes, you know, can we just move away from economics and, and achieve um, uh, outcomes we like better in court? I, I have to say I'm really skeptical. I do think that there that the merger guideline revision process that we're undergoing now should be much more explicit in trying to explain what Tommaso mentioned, the kind of the role of incentives um, and, and ability um, in, um, in companies' adverse um, behavior toward competition, whether the, in the merger context, um, specifically in the guidelines, but also in the broad, more broadly in the conduct case. I think the agencies can do a better job to try and help judges um, lay out a, a blueprint for why those types of behaviors are problematic, um, say in you know, acquisitions of potential um, or nascent competitors um, to, to do a better job of articulating coordinated effects harms. Because I think one of the huge benefits of the 2010 guidelines was that we, we increased the agency's ability to enforce against unilateral harm. And that's, you know, it's important not to understate that contribution. That was really, I think, quite a significant step forward. Um, but I think at the same time, we've perhaps been under enforcing against coordinated effects, tacit collusion, say. And I think, again, that's in part because we can't run a regression that says, you know, here's the coefficient that tells you, judge, that this merger is going to increase the probability of tacit coordination by X percent. There's that, you know, that doesn't exist. So we need to articulate those theories of harm better and explain that the evidence is going to be more qualitative. Um, and, uh, and I think um, at, on things like the structural presumptions, which I, you know, there's, there's a, I think an expectation that there will be um, perhaps both a change in the thresholds and a change in emphasis on those. I, I would say, I think in general, that's probably positive. I was stunned by a paper that Carl Shapiro and Howard Chelansky published uh, um, looking at litigated mergers in the 10 years before the 2010 guidelines and in the 10 years after the 2010 guidelines. And they, they looked at the average HHI kind of before merger and after merger and what the delta was for these litigated cases. And their conclusion from their table, I think it's table two in the paper, was that there's been no drift upward in terms of, of um, not enforcing um, against mergers at, at a certain concentration level, despite the fact that the, the 2010 guidelines substantially raised that concentration threshold for highly um, 
um, uh, for markets that that um, had had very little competition were highly concentrated. What I took away from that table was that the average HHI for litigated mergers was over 5,000. So that on average, we were litigating mergers to duopoly. And if that doesn't tell you that our deterrence system is screwed up, I don't know what does. And I just thought that was such a, a striking fact. And it was true before and it's true after. I think that does come back to resources. I think firms are just thinking if you know if you can notify 3,000 mergers to the agencies, they're not gonna have time to look at all of them. And especially if yours isn't huge, maybe you just skirt right through um, with your merger to, to triopoly or duopoly, or in some cases, when I was at DOJ, we were litigating mergers to monopoly. So I think, I think putting more emphasis on the structural presumption might help reduce litigation costs, but let's be real. The structural presumption depends on market definition because it depends on market shares. And that's not, you know, that's where most, at least in the mergers that we litigated when I was at DOJ, that's where most of the trial time gets spent is what's the market. And so it's not a panacea, but but maybe it helps somewhat. Okay, thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, a few very quick questions to Jan and Tomas. Uh, well, you said that you know there is nothing really new now. Uh, there is something that we already know how to you know regulate work on. However, I think that, you know, if you talk about uh, um, network in the 90s or the beginning of the 20s, you thought of a physical infrastructure that uh, could be the source of, um, you know, market power for some firms and, and would create, you know, economies of scale, but on the supply side, you know, on the production side. Whereas if you uh, mention network Today, you, you know, your mind goes to some something intangible, okay, which creates economies of scale, but on the demand side. So maybe we have to change the regulatory approach a little bit. So interoperability should be the answer rather than sharing the infrastructure because the infrastructure is not that important. So do you think that this could be an, a good response? I, I completely agree with what, you line, uh, what, what your outline is of, of the issue. I, I, I think that there are substantial differences. I didn't want to imply that it's exactly the same. Um, also, every network effect is not the same. There are, call it virtual networks today that seem to be working well, in the sense that we want, sometimes we want competing networks. For example, the, the dating app uh, uh, market wants a lot of different markets because you want somehow to differentiate the product between, you know, whatever the characteristics of uh, type of, of dates people look for. So not everything is, you know, Instagram, which wants the largest size uh, uh, possible. I also agree with you that, that interoperability can be an answer. I mean, we all take it for granted that we can send an email from the server of, you know, your company to Gmail to my university because interoperability was built in, in the backbone of, of the network. But now I can't send a message from WhatsApp to Signal or to WeChat because, you know, they're closed networks. And I think interoperability there can, can do a lot to, you know, basically exploit the size of a network, like the backbone of the internet, but at the same time allow for competition of operators on that network. And what Toma was referring to earlier about the difference between the US and Europe in terms of mobile phone plans, part of it is that this small piece of regulation that we have here is that the European you know, cell phone towers have to open up their network to competitors. I mean, and that's why prices are half what they are in the US, and that's why there's 150 operators in Europe and three in the US. So, so I think interoperability is an answer to many problems, not of course the only answer, uh, uh, but it's an answer to many questions. So you want a short answer, it's been too long, I agree with what you said. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, Toma, you, you already mentioned you made a distinction between the tech and non-tech sectors. So I wonder why there is so much emphasis on digital markets, where 
you know, other industries may be as important as the uh, digital uh, industries and, uh, you know, have the same uh, market power problems. And I also wonder whether, you know, the labor market that was mentioned in the session before the break today also deserves, in your opinion, some attention from the competition agents. Well, so <clears throat> on the labor market, yes, and I think it is getting the attention. So uh, I think there the research is going on. The, clearly, the attention by the regulator is there. So I think that that's clearly a, an improvement. Um, I, I still believe the, the main difference in tech is, is speed. There is, I, I, and then, because, like, say, you, you mentioned interoperability. That's a very old idea. So, uh, in other words, if I look at the list of solutions for what we might do uh, with respect to competition in the tech sector, I, I don't think any of them is really new. I think better merger control would be would be the right thing. And then clearly we have the threshold issue. We have how do you find what's a big firm? Um, and that, but again, that's a question of speed. See what I mean? Like the the, the, the tricky thing with tech is, is because things go so fast. It means that uh, you can acquire a uh, dominant position very quickly. And also the flip side of exactly the same point is that you can make an acquisition at a time where the company that you that your target is still extremely small. So it would be below any threshold based on revenues, for instance. Um, but because of the speed at which you can build the network, it, it's still extremely variable. That's, that's the essence of what happened with uh, WhatsApp uh, and Instagram. Um, so I think, so again, I think that the, I don't believe we need to, to to reinvent the wheel. I think that we don't need to change. I find that I don't think I think the consumer welfare standard is still you know roughly the right the right framework, uh, but just we need to enforce it better. And on on that, I think I'm really hundred percent with Nancy. At the end of the day, it's just about you know resources and and if you think another word, one way to think about it. Suppose you run a counterfactual of our history over the past say thirty years. What do you think would really move the needle? Is it that we change a bit like the, the, the guidelines or is it that we just double the budget of the enforcers in the US? And I think I'm 100% with Nance on that one, which is the thing that would actually have moved the needle in my counterfactual uh, uh, thought experiment is to have a much bigger budget for the enforcers. And that's exactly why you see where the real money is because you have many uh, policymakers and politicians talking about being tough on uh, competition, except they don't vote the budget. So that just revealed preference that they are that took is cheap. So I'm 100% on that. The other thing where I also want to reemphasize something that Nancy said, I am a bit skeptical of regulation in the sense that, I mean, telecom industry in France, you know, we had three operators and they were tightly regulated and, and service was bad and, and, and prices were high. And, then at, and I was regulated, right? And then the reason we have each cheap now is it's some form of deregulation. Now I agree with Ian, it's, it's not. It's a smart deregulation in the sense that you let the market, you let, you favor the entry of new operators. And that's how we got better service and lower prices. But of course, to do that, you do have some regulation to allow the entrant to come in. And so, when free entered the French market, there was a policy that says for the first two years before you build your network, yes, we're going to force the other guys to rent out at cost plus. So yes, there is some regulation there, but it's geared towards making the market more competitive, not regulating the market directly. Because I. I I would be just like Nancy, a bit skeptical that we would be we would have good regulation. I think competition is much safer, even if it's not first best. I think it would be better. Could I just modify what Tom Tomas had said um, with respect to the the you know it will will doubling or tripling budgets be enough? And I would say, I, I, as I said in my initial remarks, and I'm I'm great happy for the endorsement. I do think that would have an enormous effect. There are some areas take merger policy, but even worse in the US in conduct, where I think the courts are so hostile and so skeptical that we may well, to move the needle, we may well need um, some form of legislation. And I'm not terribly optimistic about that, but I think about say <clears throat> vertical mergers where each agency has just recently lost um, uh, yet again, challenges to a vertical merger. You know, Thank God for the European Commission blocking Illumina Grail, which the, the FTC was unsuccessful in blocking. Um, potential competition mergers, I think, are just so challenging because you don't have a market share and judges seem very skeptical of intent evidence. Um, we need to, to try to overcome that. And then in the conduct space, the case law that's developed in the US, and I think this Supreme Court is likely to make it even worse. Um, you know, it's just is, is terrible for plaintiffs, for either government enforcers or private plaintiffs. Um, and so while I do think 
substantially increasing the agency budgets will help a lot and enable them to take some more innovative cases um, to court. I think the problem with innovative cases is if you lose, you cannot just lose the case, but you can accumulate even worse case law precedent that other courts will rely on and you know, just make it impossible to dig out of the, the holes. So I think academics working on this to try and, and change the priors that, that, um, that courts should have you know, more attention to what those um, those arguments are against this type of, of either conduct or mergers. Um, but, you know, it, it, it may not be something the agencies can do on their own, even if they're well funded. Yep. So there is, there seems to be a general agreement among all of us that ultimately we do like competition and we like it quite a lot compared, say, to an alternative of regulation which has failed in different ways in the past, which partial, partially answers a question that you posed on the body answer. You said, okay, we have a consumer welfare standard. Somebody is, is proposing now to replace it with, you know, the competitive process, what the hell is that? That's exactly the point. So a competition without competitors is a very abstract notion. So we need, at, at the end of the day, we need competitors. And without that, um, you know, the outcomes we see in markets are not very good for, for consumers. So there is a notion that the competitive process is something we can deal with. Since we want to go ahead in two minutes, what would I do? Uh, ideally, so in my dream shopping list, I've got two items. One, as an academic, I really would like to try, I don't know how to solve it though, there is a huge collective action problem, there is lots of well-intentioned academics which, are, which have views similar to ours, but we cannot get our act together, and we should dispel some urban legends, some myths which percolate instead in the competition with the competition crowd. For instance, the urban myth that vertical murders are presumptively uh, and there is a presumption of efficiency in vertical mergers. This doesn't emerge anywhere in the literature, anywhere. Or that mergers um, among large firms with market power will generate efficiencies. There is no evidence, once again. So this is something that it would be great if there was a neutral voice of independent academics, but we, can, we don't have the incentives to do that. And, and instead, there are some think tanks which are glorified advocates, which are always in front of the regulators, which distill economic theory for the usage of the, of the competition law crowd, and they tell you there is a presumption in economics that vertical mergers are efficient. There is a presumption that mergers uh, will generate efficiencies among large firms, not general picture, right? The selected few firms. And this doesn't exist. So it would be great if academia could come together. Will it ever do that? I hope so, but will it happen? I don't know. The second thing, which is already what um, Nancy mentioned, but I wanted to elaborate for a second on this structural presumption, yes, you still need a market definition, but you need to employ the resources of agencies in a useful way. To, to spend most of limited resources fighting as to whether Facebook is dominant or not in social networks, I think it's a waste of resources. Because then the people come to you and say, oh, my, my daughter uses TikTok, therefore Facebook is doomed. But who cares about your daughter? Sorry, I'm, I'm sure she's great, but they have three billion customers in the world right now, and they've been having three billion customers over the past 10 years. And so there must be some imperfect, there is no magic number, some imperfect structural parameters on size, precision, Systems and revenues that we can use as a brief cutoff. We lower the standard of proof there. Yes, we do that so we can move on on the meat of the case where, the, where real analysis is, is needed and something that Nancy didn't mention, but it's, it's important. You're going to have a rebuttable structural presumption where you throw the ball into the camp of Facebook, say, or Meta as they call themselves now, and you ask them, why do you need to buy this firm? Show me with your data because that's when the information is. As an agency, I don't have that kind of information, so use. Your, your, your information to prove me that you need that action, that behavior, that merger to do something which is helpful for customers in the end and prove it. And you can, if you want, the standard of proof can be different there. But this solution is out there and I think it would be a much better outcome where economics, and by the way, I said we are part of a problem, but I'm passionate about economics. That's why I'm here because I'm saying economics can be used wonderfully to elaborate a cogent theory of arm, to look into the data, to investigate internal documents. You can use economics in fantastic ways even if you don't run a regret because you don't have a luxury of running a regression when you have a, a merger that you have to decide in for weeks, okay? And that's, I think, what we can do, and that's where we should be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Tommaso. I hope you would appreciate the time providing the forum for four fantastic academics to share their view with uh, the policymaker and the 
and the antitrust community in, in general. Uh, now, uh, I, as I said, I would like, I, I want to leave some time for questions from, from the audience, so that's, the time is now. <laughs> sure. Hi, uh, Joe Harrington from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, learned a lot from what you all are saying, a very productive conversation. I'd like to put out a concrete uh, change in merger policy and just be interested in your reaction to it. Uh, but let me just say, let's put aside the resource constraint, which is uh, could obviously serious, but look at it from, from uh, another perspective uh, where resource is not an issue, uh, which is uh, to make uh, part of a merger decision, or at least a part of a toolkit, part of a merger decision, an ex post evaluation. That is, rather than simply kind of prohibit, allow, or allow with a, with a remedy a merger, it might be a, a problematic merger, may be allowed, but it would be evaluated in some sort of process, you know, X years into the future. I put this forward, not that it would be used in all cases, but it would be as part of the toolkit. And I should say, before it's possibly dismissed as unrealistic, uh, we know that some hospital mergers have been ex post undone. So it might really be possible. So I'd just be interested in your all's reaction. OK. So uh, yes, uh, there would be practical difficulties, but it's, it's a good su suggestion. It has also an, an added uh, potential value, making data available also to third parties, to the academics, so we can do more and more. More and more ex post assessments are badly needed. We don't do enough of them. The agencies have a conflict of interest. They don't want to evaluate their own work in the past. I know that Layer has tried to do some with the CMA. Some regulators are more open to that, but the more we have, we need data. We are hunger. There's a hunger, hunger for, for, for data to do this kind of ex post ass assessment. But if the, um, yes, so not, not, not only is, is what you say, but I would say Say on top of that, also make sure that the data in anonymized form, et cetera, et cetera, can also be vetted by, by third parties. Yeah, I think that's actually, Joe, probably the biggest impediment to that suggestion, which has, you know, it's been, I think, kicking around both in academia and in the enforcement community and, and even at the agencies for a long time. I, I think the DOJ attorneys don't think that they have any ability to compel parties to produce data. There's some possible exception that maybe you could get a court to agree to that in a settled merger and a consent decree. But if you if you decide not to challenge the merger, um, I don't think they believe there's any way that, that the current law would en enable them to compel that. The FTC, as you know, has the ability to compel firms to produce data in certain circumstances, so it might it might be better. I think the reason we don't see more merger retrospectives, and we do see a lot of them in some industries, is because of data access. And I think the hospital is a great example. I think the FTC's retrospective was largely done with um, publicly available, that is non-firm level data. And I think that's why we see so many retrospectives in say um, airlines or energy or you know, beer, consumer products, we're starting to see that because those data can be obtained by academics. Um, but if, you know, if there were a way to, to get Congress to authorize agencies to compel this at least, or for at least some fraction of mergers or something, I, I think it would help. I, I mean, I agree with, with Joe's uh, suggestion. Just on the issue of data, I mean, m maybe there's, imperfect but simple ways to, to do that kind of ex post verification. I mean, just based on, on the income statement and the balance sheet, you can calculate quite a lot of uh, ex post, very verifiable statistics. But better data is gonna be more precise and better, but you know, why not just use the income statement and the, the balance sheet for a start? And it will be much better than now, but it's to a large extent pretty much cheap talk because you can argue whatever you want. If you convince the judge, that's it. I mean, it, it's it's, not necessarily verifiable exposed because there's uncertainty exposed. So, so why not start with minimal data and, and do it? For people interested in some weird precedent, if my memory doesn't fail me, in 2018, when I was at Digicomp, we approved a merger in the cellulose industry for making paper involving Brazilian producers. And in that decision, we managed to get in a provision where they had to send data exposed 
to the Commission. So try to dig into the case. I don't remember the legal jargon, that's the, but there is a precedent where the, I don't know what happened. I have no idea. Uh, my colleagues, uh, um, I don't know what they have, what they, but, they, but we did put into that merger, they had to give some data on prices on the cellulose, Susano Papel. Uh, I mean, my memory is, uh, is may, maybe it was something completely different, but I have this thing in Brazil in 2018, yeah. So I think it's a good idea. Um, and it's the reason it's a good idea is in part because given today, in today's world, it would be very impractical as we, as was explained. Uh, but if we moved a little bit in that direction, um, then it would create incentives uh, that were positive, that would be positive in many uh, dimensions. So one is the data release, the fact that it would, it would create more incentive to do more exposed evaluation would, would be great. Um, but also I think that if, I mean, in a world, if you think from first principle, if I tell you we live in a world now where there is more uncertainty and, and things move faster, then uh, that means um, ex ante zero one decisions are going to be harder. So yes, it would be great if we could make a decision and then stick to it because the legal certainty and everything. But if that's not feasible anymore, then we need to uh, consider alternatives. And uh, you know, one of them could be that there is uh, some notion that we can revisit the case automatically after a couple of years and then change our mind based on new data. In a world where the where information flows and decisions are uh, happen faster, then that might be uh, one of the second best uh, solution. Despite the fact that, of course, there would be a cost of all the uncertainty created by not making a final decision. Uh, I will say, Joe, to your point, we know that in industries where there are consent or in firms where there are consent decrees that are having the agencies um, monitor adherence, that we tend to see um, better behavior until that consent decree expires. Not always, <laughs> but often. So maybe your data proposal also has the benefit that even if the merger is anti-competitive, the firms don't exercise their market power until their requirement to provide data expires. Very good. Other questions? Thank you, um, Philip Hansbach, UI. I have a question specifically for Tommaso. In spite of the incentives, do you think there's any um, productive way to engage with the output of consultancies or think tanks, given that there are probably a lot of smart economists working there, and probably not all of them ill-intentioned, but indeed often incentivized by corporate interests? I mean, there is a huge variety, of course. Um, but the answer is yes. One possibility is to make their own reports open to the public, I mean, redacted, because there is, I mean, incentives work, reputation matters. I've seen a lot of bad stuff in my life, and I think uh, things will be written in a different way if those reports uh, would be made available to other people. And, so, and I think that that would help a lot. And secondly, having those... Um, I mean, greater interaction with the wider academic community. So this is, by the way, a very interesting moment in the history of antitrust. The past three, four years, there has been a change for sure in mood, in discussions, and uh, we have widened up the discussion of the fact that there is Thomas and Jan is already a reflection. It's not just uh, us, the old foxes, always here repeating our views. So it's a, it's, it's a good moment. It's important also that the consultancies understand what I said earlier, that sometimes you go too much in, so I've done a research, for instance, it's anecdotal, but a good survey about the methods which are used by the economic consultants in, in, in Europe in, in, the, in the past five years. And it's, it's interesting to see that most of the time spent by the economists there is calculating market shares, okay? like 50% of the time. Then there is, on the more sophisticated, there is a little bit of GAPI, UPP, these kind of things. There is uh, uh, some demand estimation like Logit, a few surveys, forget about BLP, random coefficient models, this doesn't exist. It's also trying to understand what's the practice of, uh, of economic reasoning and what we do in academia, I think that would be a massively interesting discussion also to, to show the academics, look, what you're doing is not perhaps what we are doing in, uh, in, in the day work. Is it helpful? Is it, is, it, is it not helpful? So that kind of thing would be incredibly good. As long as we, we, we try to go there free of our agendas, and, there is, uh, and which is difficult because typically there are uh, repeated clients which have a, a specific interest, and that's, that's difficult to solve, but um, I'm hopeful, and this is a reflection that this is happening already, yes.
Uh, thank you very much um, for that very insightful panel. Uh, my name is Hardin Rajisusu from South Africa. Yes, I hope you can hear. It's a very brief and straightforward question. I've had, I think, panelists, I think it's Thomas, saying, well, it's clear the, the consumer welfare standard, it's unquestionably the sort of most appropriate standards, if I heard this correctly. I just want to ask, since we're talking about the future, what's your view on this more expansive view uh, beyond consumer welfare? Because we can see that uh, the outcomes out there beyond competition. So if you look at simple indicators around inequality, uh, they are worsening, not just for uh, developing countries like ourselves, but also developed countries. So w what do you think ought to be the appropriate uh, uh, standard? I know that you, I think Thomas was yeah. more specific to it, but uh, maybe you could answer with the... With the yes, I think there are two points in your question. First, I strongly believe that whatever standard one wants should be an expression of our democracies. So it's good that competition policy is not now a very narrow debate and should belong to what society thinks the appropriate standard should be, and that becomes whatever society wants. And so so that, that, that's, a, that's a general and generic answer. Specifically, I am still in favor of the consumer welfare standard. As an economist, we have the, an easy answer, which is the consumer welfare standard is very flexible because I can put there innovation, choice, effects on workers, I can do everything. Yes, but this is where instead I have different views compared to some colleagues. In practice, we have narrowed it down to static effects on prices according to very specific model. So that way we have implemented the consumer welfare standard that is imploding, and it has imploded. So either we try with good economics to really widen the consumer welfare standard, don't ask the impossible task of quantifying everything with the mathematical method, and be, you know, as I said, coherent with a set of documents, business strategies from inside, and you can look at the impact on investment, on choice, on labor, and you can do that using eco economics, but we need to be aligned, so we need, you know, the law, the economics to allow cases to be run and not to be lost in court. Instead, if it doesn't happen, and I think society, rightly so, will question what's the use of your very narrow, you're just searching under the lamppost for the only one thing where you have developed some methods, but that's a very, it's not even a theory of second best, it's a theory of tenth best. Why should your standard be better than anything else? So let's try with something else. And, 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 and I have this, this, this view that the New Brandesian are so disillusioned somehow with the way we implemented economics in practice that they want to try something else. True, it's a jump into the void but if uh, we are not able to move beyond what we have done until now, I think the burden of proof is on us to see whether we can still reassure with, with our tools we can do something useful. Otherwise, I think this implosion is going in one direction only. So can I just, can I just highlight, I think, what's a tension in this debate? And, and it comes to, I think, a suspicion of competition, actually. So I'm not going to disagree with Tommaso, and of course, you know, society, collectively, democracies decide what, what, at least in an ideal world, I don't know if that really is a reflection of how we actually make decisions, but ideally should decide collectively what our, what our goals are and therefore even with antitrust policy what our standards are. But the danger I see in moving away from something that is focused on competition, and even I will say, you know, Tommaso made reference to something I hear uh, around the U.S. a lot, which is you can't have competition without competitors. I think slides into something which becomes, and here's where I think the, the, the articulation of the consumer welfare standard made a distinction, which is competition law is not designed to protect individual firms if that doesn't further the goal of competition. Um, and that's why we allow mergers, because if the goal was to preserve every, every individual firm, we wouldn't allow anybody to buy anybody else. Um, and, and I think this tension between we can call it, um, you know, inequality. We can call it um, uh, consumer preferences, small businesses, and all. Uh, here's the here's what I think of: take a company like Walmart. Um, Walmart has come into U.S. markets and dramatically lowered the prices that that people who shop at Walmart pay. 
Um, there's there have been studies that demonstrate that this tends to benefit in particular lower income people. At the same time, when Walmart comes into a community, often some of the smaller businesses that it might have competed with close. And that hurts those business owners and it hurts the people who are working in those in those smaller um, firms, those smaller retail outlets. You know, should antitrust authorities decide, and now I'm not thinking about mergers, but should they decide Walmart just shouldn't be allowed to charge low prices? Because even if it has, and let's just stipulate, we have to call it Walmart, call it Big Mart. Suppose a company has done the investments that Jan described, invested, and, and that Tomas described it, invested a ton in becoming more efficient and lowering their costs and therefore enabling them to charge lower prices. And suppose there's nothing that they've done that's anti-competitive, no exclusionary conduct, no you know, outright goals to, to drive prices down, to, to drive out rivals and then raise prices, no predatory behavior, whatever. Should we go after Walmart because their existence and their strategy of charging low prices disadvantages higher cost, smaller organizations? And if we do, are we comfortable saying all of those consumers who presently shop at Walmart are not going to have the benefit of the low prices and that their cost of living is going to increase dramatically because they don't have access to that? And that's sort of where I see the rubber meeting the road in some of this debate. I don't think there's an easy answer, but I will say personally, you know, as somebody who um, spent a lot of time in rural America where Walmart is viewed quite favorably from a, a price perspective, um, I, I, I worry that, that some of what we're talking about is going to push us toward um, telling companies, even if you can charge low prices, don't. So I, I think that the, um, um, I agree with, I probably agree with what Thomas and Nancy said. So I will make two points. The first is, yes, we should be open to criticism about the standard that we are using in practice. I think spending a lot of time arguing about whether we want to call it uh, X, Y, Z, consumer person or something else, I think we sh there is a semantic debate that I don't think is that useful. I think it's how is it used in practice? And there we should you know, be willing to accept criticism and everything. Um, and that's absolutely fair. And we should be open to that. On the other hand, uh, from very pragmatic reason, I think that, um, you know, I think that, you know, I think enforcing, making sure markets remain competitive for the benefit of consumers is already a huge task. And I think to some extent, uh, in some industries, in some places, in some time periods, we failed at that. So I don't think widening the goal is going to help us achieve the thing we're already not achieving. And in practice, I, I, there's a lot of danger in bringing another objective. It's something that I've seen also happening, just think about it. There are other tools that governments can use to reduce inequality. Now, if you tell them it's the job of the, the antitrust agency to also take care of inequality, they're going to think, okay, then I can go and rest and not do anything. So that is also not a good outcome. So I'm, I'm in that sense, I'm still old fashioned. I think one problem, one tool, and then with a clear mandate, and we, we don't try to mix because even if I agree with the goal of reducing inequality, I don't think uh, it would be well done if we move it to the antitrust side. I just want to add one point that is that we tend to use, you know, the, the, the consumer welfare standard, but in a partial equilibrium setting, but we know that there are effects on other markets, other prices, and, and many of the, the discussions that are surrounding that you know, whether this is the right standard, ultimately boil down often to what are these general equilibrium effects? What are these effects on other prices, on, on wages? And in a sense, you know, I, I think we recognizing that these effects exist, but going beyond the partial equilibrium kind of measurement, it's still the consumer welfare standard. The only difference is that you realize that there's different markets, you know, interacting at the same time. We had a discussion in the session before lunch on the coexistence of monopsony with uh, goods market power. Well, you know, these are general equilibrium effects and these co coexist and, and interact with each other. Ultimately, the standard is the same one. It's just recognizing that these interactions are there. And ultimately, you know, if, if competition is uh, increasing in these markets, is gonna have these effects on these uh, uh, markets automatically, but while maintaining same uh, uh, standards, 
recognizing that they're broader than just you know one particular market, that they're interacting markets. Can I just say as a former enforcer, Jan, I totally disagree with you. <laughs> and in fact, you know, this is exactly the argument that that Anthem made in the Anthem Cigna Health Insurance merger here, that, you know, Your Honor, you should just, you know, trust us, we're going to lower prices upstream, DOJ alleged because of their market power, but you know, that'll help people downstream and we're just going to make the whole system more efficient. And and Judge Amy Berman Jackson said, it's not my job as a federal district court judge to decide the optimal organization of the American healthcare sector. That's Congress's job. And to, to Tomas's point, like it is complicated enough to bring a merger case successfully or a, even more a conduct case through the courts. If, if you now require the, the agencies to prove the general equilibrium effects of their enforcement action, it's all gonna to grind to a halt and we will get no enforcement. So even though that might be from an economic perspective ideal, you know, I think we protect competition in, in the US and merger in any relevant market. And so if it harms upstream workers, we should bring that challenge and we shouldn't be worrying a lot about how it you know, moves through the system downstream because we are protecting the markets where competition is being harmed by the, the conduct or the merger. I mean, sure, but but if, if if we're faced with what currently, I mean, we see, you know, Tomas worked on this too. We see this huge decline in the labor share. We can link it to what's going on in goods markets. I mean, if if we give up and say, sure, be happy with doing one market at a time, um, then I guess we're giving up on the fact that we, we're trying to do something about the the, the state of competition in the whole economy eventually, right? Because, because ultimately these markets are all uh, uh, inter interconnected and, and I guess ju in terms of arguing in front of a judge, there's probably no other way to do it, but then we should ask the question, is this the right way, the adversarial uh, way of, of uh, uh, monitoring competition, is this the right yes. way? Are there other ways to do this <laughs> than, than, than just uh, the way we do it now? I'm not confident, first of all, if it's a problem, if, if you think the labor share is because of a lack of competition in product markets, addressing competition in product markets helps that. So I, I don't see an argument for, for, you know, I don't see an argument there. Secondly, at least with respect to the US, I suspect that an enormous amount of the decline in labor share is because we have gutted labor protection laws in the US, um, both through um, inaction, through the way courts have interpreted existing laws, um, you know, it, interacting with product markets, I'm sure as well, but, but I think if you want to protect workers, let, let's talk about ways, again, to kind of go to Tomas's point, let's talk about ways to directly protect workers and their ability to, to exercise collective bargaining, their ability to avoid this arbitration, which, you know, precludes any kind of class action on behalf of workers and so forth. Let's reinvigorate the the National Labor Relations Board, let's do that directly instead of thinking we're somehow going to solve that problem through some general equilibrium analysis of a merger. All right, we should stop here. Uh, we, we were doing quite well in you know, trying to convince lawyers in the room that, you know, economists have a common view of many topics, but uh, at the end, you know, some disagreement emerged, inevitably. Uh, we run out of time the discussion was great and i want to thank all of you for your fantastic contribution so please join me in with a big applause to thank the four speakers <laughs> and actually the festival is over <laughs> so that was you know you find in the program the ceremony uh, the what's the name the uh, closing ceremony, but there is not a ceremony, closing ceremony, so that's a good news. Uh, the, uh, the, the only thing I want to say is that it, it has been uh, you know, a marathon for us, but a uh, very rewarding <laughs> experience. I'm very pleased that many people attended uh, the festival. I've had you know, very good uh, uh, comments on the, on, on the work that we have done. And, um, you know, you have been very nice with us, so thank you very much for, for this, and I hope you enjoyed. Um, there is a lot of work behind, you know, this, uh, this event.
So the only thing I want to say to close uh, the festival, beyond you know, saying that we will uh, uh, remain in touch, get in touch, and see you uh, see, see again next year, is that I want to thank my colleagues at Lair that worked so much to make this possible. And uh, especially, I would like Silvia to stand up so that we can contribute an applause to her. OK, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, we will ask for comments again and reactions and suggestions for the next uh, uh, edition of the festival. That will be the real second one. OK, thank you very much again.